I call this meeting to order. This is a regular meeting of the Northfield Public School Board. Today is Monday, September 12, 2022, and the time is 6 p.m. This meeting is being live streamed and recorded. The recording of this meeting will be posted on the district website as soon as possible. Before we get started, I just want to thank the members of the public for attending this school board business meeting to observe the work being done on behalf of all school district stakeholders. We appreciate your time. Hey, Dr. Hellman, we have some items in the table file. Yes, we have uh, some items in the table file this evening. We have two gift agreements and then several personnel items in appointments, uh, increase, decrease, change in assignment, uh, a leave of absence, and two resignations. So that is the table file for this evening. Okay. If there's no objections, we will add these items to the agenda as we move forward. Okay. Is there a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Okay, moved by Amy, second by Jeff. Thank you. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. We do not have anyone signed um, signed in for public comment, so we'll skip that portion of our meeting. And we're on to announcements and recognitions. Is there anything you'd like to say? Yes, I have several announcements this evening. Uh, the first is that the Greenville Park Community School Report to the community was completed last month. The report details the results of the eighth year of community school programming at Greenville Park and the report which board members have a copy of at their place. And there are some uh, extras, uh, I believe, in the crowd here, if you, I think they're over on that Northfield news table, if you wanna see some. Uh, so this was uh, shared with Greenville Park families, all families with preschool children living in the Greenville Park attendance boundaries and community partners. We wanna thank everyone who assisted with the report's completion. Um, I also wanna take a moment just to share yet again that we are expanding community school programming uh, to our other two elementary schools this year. Uh, so we will have programming that is at uh, Bridgewater and at Spring Creek and board members also have a copy of the announcement that went out to families uh, at your table place so that you can just take a look at uh, the upcoming events that are happening there. Okay, get a little alarm there going. All right, that's the first announcement, squirrel. Um, the second announcement is a school board work session. So at the last board meeting, we discussed adding a work session uh, for the purposes of analyzing uh, pre-survey results. So remember, we're gonna do some hypotheticals about uh, the, the voter survey give you some potential uh, data scenarios, hypotheticals, so that you can wrestle intellectually with some of those possible results uh, before we get the data back, so you can be prepared to ha have a discussion about what that data might mean for the future of the high school facility. Uh, board members should have received an email from Anita today with two um, options for meeting dates, September 20th or 29th, both beginning at 5 p.m. Just please, board members, let Anita know and let her know which of the uh, meeting dates you prefer for the work session. I'm uh, really pleased to share with all board members this evening some data around our family conferences. So we held family conferences on August 31st and September 1st. 2,673 students had a parent uh, or caregiver attend the family conferences on those dates. Uh, elementary schools ranged from 86% to 97.5% attendance. The middle school had 74% attendance. Uh, ALC 20%, high school 25%. 98% of NCEC families participated and 100% of Portage families uh, attended the conferences. So as you know, this is a major part of our family engagement and we really are pleased overall with the success. Uh, we changed some things both at the ALC, the high school and the middle school. So we really are uh, pleased with those people who came to join us for those new ideas and the way that we presented those things. And we look forward to continuing to partner with families throughout the entire year. Uh, the final item that I have is the, just want to share with board, board members, as you know, um, North, uh, Northfield Public Schools is a founding member of the Northfield Racial and Ethnic Equity Coalition, and we are working with that group to uh, share positive messages about inclusion uh, with the community through a poster campaign, which we have two posters that will be out. We have one, it is, says that, I've got it right here, it says, um, you belong here, it's written in both English and Spanish. This art was hand-drawn and donated by uh, Nuger Communications Group. So this is one of the posters. And then we also have uh, this poster, which is Everyone Means Everyone. And so we have 46 of these posters were donated today to the Chamber of Commerce. And the Chamber of Commerce is going to be putting them in, uh, offering them to businesses. What we want is we want people not to be able to turn around without seeing these positive messages of inclusion in our community. 
we have 16 of, of the You Belong Here posters, this one. Um, we have 16 of them for the school district, co-branded with Northfield Public Schools. They are uh, 24 by 36, and so each school will at least get one. Some of our larger buildings, like the high school, will get multiple so that uh, students can see this and families and people who are visiting our buildings can see these positive messages of inclusion in our community. So we're very grateful to be along with the city of Northfield uh, and around 20 plus other organizations within the community to really spread this message that Northfield is a place where everyone belongs. So uh, this is one of the projects that that group had for this fall. So those are the announcements for this evening, uh, even with visual aids and everything tonight. <laughs> Terrific. Anybody else have a announcement or recognition to make? Okay, good. All right, we're on to our items for discussion. We have eight items tonight. And first, we're going to have a recap of the data summit. Welcome, instructional coach Carrie Duba um, and student leaders Alejandra Casper Sanchez, Maddie uh, Busman, and Connor Percy. Hi, um, Hello. my name is Maddie. My name is Alejandra. Uh, my name is Connor. Um, and today we are going to kind of be presenting on the recap of the Yeah Data Summit that we had earlier this spring. Okay, perfect. So I'm going to give you guys like a little bit of an overview on what the Yeah Data Summit was and kind of what was the purpose of it. Um, so part of the integrational activity for the acceleration and integration funding, we pair with 10th and 11th grade students from WEM, Tri-City United, and Fairbo in order to take a deeper look at the data our schools have collected and what they really mean to us as students. So on May 17th of this past spring, Northfield Public Schools hosted the event at St. John's Church. At 8.30, around 80 students from the area and select adult advisors all came together in efforts to spark change. The goal of a summit is for the districts involved to uncover a new perspective, a student perspective, with the hopes to gain insight from the students, like why these issues are occurring, like take a deeper look about the different situations that's going on and how we can see how these different students are being disadvantaged. And through that, we can come up with new ideas and actionable steps to help combat the different disparities that exist within our schools. So specifically this year's topic, the things that we talked about were attendance and credit, credit progression and et cetera. Um, so you can see in the picture, um, I guess that's Connor and I, and we were some of the student leaders along with Isaac Lear who couldn't make it today and Alejandra. Um, and so along with us as kind of the four main leaders who really helped like propel this um, summit, six other Northfield students led group discussions and an additional 10 other Northfield students added valuable insight at the summit. And here you can see a picture of one of the tables that we had. We had multiple table groups with, as Maddie said, uh, a leader, from Northfield and we split into, we split the, the students from the different yeah, areas. Yeah, the students from the different areas. So we could gather insight from all schools and see the different perspectives and processes based on population size and statistics um, that differed between each school. And each video. Um, and so another thing that the students, um, you can see the student leaders in action here. Oh, wait, how do we do that? Well, we'll come back to that later. Yeah. Can we access this? Oh. Are you playing a video? Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks.
Thanks for your patience. <laughs> So what you're going to see in this video um, <laughs> that is linked to the photo is basically just um, a video of Alejandra and Isaac kind of introducing the whole group of students um, on that day. And they're going to be kind of talking about the demographic overviews and what we're going to be doing that day. So you'll yeah. see that in just a moment. OK. Here we go. Perfect. Oh. Yeah. Well, that was a video to explain the chaos. <laughs> um, that was a video of towards the end of our data summit, we had a rock, paper, scissors contest just to close it out. And everyone participated and we narrowed it down to like two players at the very end where there was two long lines and then the winner won a $25 gift card. <laughs> yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Should we just move on then? All right, and then the process, as Maddie said, this was a student-led process. And so we were able to meet during Flex and organize this, the four of us, along with Malia and Carrie helping us, or Miss Duba helping us um, to organize a schedule of, not only icebreakers, but our whole meal plan. And it might not seem like important details, but we thought a lot about all the small details, especially the food, because we know that that can help um, bring us together and get us to help sharing ideas um, since we were coming, since some students were coming far away from different districts. And then we had two breakout groups where we broke out into small groups to do icebreakers and then a data dive where that was the first group where we had students from all different districts sit at a table and look through data and understand it and share ideas and then we had lunch and then got into our district groups where we were able to identify problems and create action plans that we wanted to implement based on the problems that we saw with our data and why we thought that certain patterns were occurring. Okay, so on this slide, um, you're supposed to come at one of the time, but it's okay. Um, so on this slide, you can see a bunch of the different posters that um, all the morning groups made looking at that data that Alejandro was talking about. Um, we just thought up a lot of ideas. These were kind of general ideas for a bunch of different schools. So some of the stuff you'll see on these posters, if you look closer, our school already has, which is great. And some of the stuff are stuff that maybe we thought that we could improve on, um, but just a ton of different ideas. We had like 10 of these boards up on the wall. It was a great opportunity to just share back and discover what all these different people were thinking. Yeah, and even after we put them on the wall, we had a whole discussion and breakdown where we all went through and discussed them. Here you can see some more up close views of some of the posters and some ideas we thought were um, pretty standout, repeated a lot um, across many posters. Uh, we have like addressing and dismantling stereotypes among students and kind of like making sure that all people are connected and uh, friends and breaking down like clicks and things. Um, we got like role model programs, like having like a big buddy, like something like Link or Web, uh, something that's really good. Um, better classroom environments, like sizes, um, more engaging and um, including opinions of students and statistics. Uh, look at foundation of students, like elementary and middle school and how those can help um, make a better foundation, I guess, for high school, um, want to make school safe environments. Um, and then if we take a closer look, here is Northfield's specific proposal. We need to click on this. Yeah. Try something. 
And overall, I think, this no, was, I think I got okay. it. Okay. And overall, this was just a really great opportunity to collaborate with WEM and Tri City and Fairboat and really understand not only the things that we think here at Northfields, but the things that other students are experiencing in our nearby areas. And so that gave us really good insight into kind of the programs that they might have and how we can implement them and see what we're doing right and what they're doing right and how we want to combine all that. And another part that was key is that not only were we exchanging these ideas, we were exchanging them in a specifically student-led environment and student-driven environment. There were adults in the room, but they were on the side of the room and watching. And so we were able to communicate comfortably and have a welcome environment with meeting students. Yeah, and so at the end of the day, um, kind of after all of our areas, kind of we all combined and we all met together, we all separated into our different school districts. And that's when we had an opportunity to kind of make a rough draft of our proposal and what we really wanted to implement. And so you can see, um, we're gonna kind of be reading to you and explaining to you kind of what our proposal is and what exactly we wanna do with this. Okay, so the first section we have is just like the overarching issue. Um, this is kind of the main thing that we thought was really helpful and things that we thought were most important and were coming up the most. Um, so we have students being connected to support and support programs. Um, this issue is exasperated by a lack of role models for students, both students to student and student to teacher facility caring adult. Um, students getting connected to support programs is made more difficult by a lack of diverse communication methods between the school, schools, district, and families. And the proposal, we had two points to increase the number of role models via two routes, um, student to student role models and teacher faculty slash adult, adult role models. Um, we wanted to leverage and expand the link program because we think it's a great vehicle that we have in the district and especially at the high school and we think that through the link program we could um, expand or um, help students through it or just make it better um, and specifically by creating long relation year-long relationships between upper and lower classmen and considering changing the link leaders through the year so that the age difference isn't as great so there's a better um, understanding between students as well as empowering link leaders to act in early intervention role through a collaboration with students supporting students so that students can receive and be informed about um, the supports throughout the school in the beginning of the year but also throughout the year because in the beginning of the year, they're just getting to know the high school and might not need them right away, but they might be so overwhelmed with everything else that they forget or they might um, overlook the supports. And then when they need them, they might not know where to go. And then we also wanted to improve the awareness of the programs that exist to offer support to students by ensuring that all communications are sent to families in a variety of ways and languages and ensuring programs are promoted throughout the school year, not just at the beginning. Yeah, um, and so kind of one of the things that we realized is that when we were at this summit is that Northfield has so many great programs compared to other schools who might not be as fortunate as us and as like developed in these areas like tutoring and counseling services. And so we realized we have all these great things but how can we make them more accessible to students? And so with these next steps, we hope to meet with link leaders and high school administrators to help really understand the programs that we have and how we can expand them and enhance them to like make them on an even deeper level. And so some things we talked about is maybe um, kind of strengthening these programs in the second half of the year. So we can really like focus on driving through that help and that support from other students. And some other things we talked about and we hope to continue pursuing and understanding is, can link leaders be trained to act as early interveners? How can they recognize mental health struggles and get a deep understanding of how these programs are accessible to students? Um, and so some other things we talked about is developing a more thorough communication plan with not only our teachers and our students, but our families and making sure they're widely accessible and increasing awareness and accessibility around financial aid for these extracurricular programs and all these amazing things we already have in place.
So we really look forward to doing these things um, in the next months to follow and working to continue to make this YAD Data Summit something that we can really implement at the high school. Thank you. Thank you, that was terrific. Board members, do you have any questions or comments? Amy? I just wanna say congratulations on an excellent event and an excellent presentation. I really appreciate how you not only talked in generalities at the event, but ended up with specific ideas of how you can make improvements. And we have a lot of the right people here tonight hearing these ideas. So uh, look around you yeah. <laughs> and know that uh, it, it, uh, changes that come from students because you understand each other and you understand where the students are coming from can be so um, helpful to all of the programs that we have. So I look forward to uh, hearing what happens with all of this and um, hearing more about what you're doing through this whole year. And I hope you'll come back and talk to us in the spring. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else have a comment or question? Julie? So I want to echo what Amy says and then also um, extend our thanks to Car Carrie Duba for, for working with these students. But um, really incredible work. And I think you um, are really a um, amazing example of the power of the student voice and what we hear from student voice. And I think one of the things that is really sparked my interest is really early intervention with link leaders because mm -hmm. they see them this summer before high school starts. And I think that is a really, really strong proposal. And I'm anxious to hear how, how that plays out. So thanks for all of your work, your leadership and your amazing presentation. Yes, I also wanna say thank you to um, all of you, to Maddie, Alejandra and um, Connor. Thanks for presenting tonight. Um, very well put together, great ideas. And I'm wondering, um, after you put this proposal together, who like who who did you give it to? To like, do you keep that, or did you give it to somebody else? Does uh, Carrie Duba take that on? How, what's the follow up on this proposal? Okay. Um. So initially, we just kind of gave it to Carrie and Malia just to like set aside until we could present it to you guys. But we do want to meet with the high school administrators and kind of like possibly carry forward some of these things. Um. Obviously, we can't do all of this right away, or um, even in the year to follow. But like. We would just like to like try to get this into absolutely. And we also um, talked about speaking to link representatives, um, both student and adult, just to understand the program better um, and learn about it from them and see what they think about our proposal. Yeah, so we plan to make sure that we're all involved throughout the rest of the process, um, along with Carrie and Malia. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next we have Activities Director Baba Sullivan presenting the High School Activities Department Continuous Improvement Plan. Welcome, Baba. Thank you. Thank you for having me and inviting me to speak about our activities program. Um, students, great job. As the Activities Director, you should know that your names have already been forwarded to Jody Saxton West, our speech teacher, and she'll be contacting you tomorrow. <laughs> All right, we'll start with a couple of slides you're familiar with, um, but important slides. Our vision at Northfield Schools, as you know, is to prepare, prepare every student for lifelong success by developing critical thinkers who are curious and ready to engage in our society. And that's not just done in the classroom, it's done through our activities programs as well. Um, our strategic plan, our commitments to people, learner outcomes, equity, communication, stewardship, and partnership are things we value in our activities program. and we. Uh, are certainly um, things that we hope that we can develop in our students and through our programs. All right, so our purpose, um, our, the purpose of the NHS Activities Department uh, is to provide first-class programs that provide our students with an opportunity to grow, compete, and learn life lessons that reflect the school and community values. I had a chance to look at last year's goals and review those, and it's kind of an awkward situation uh, for to inherit someone else's goals, but uh, 
I think there were some excellent goals last year and I got a chance to sort of take a peek and see how we did. So the family engagement goal uh, last year was to provide three to one surveys and summary reports to coaches and parents for every activity. Um, the activities program did meet with each coach at the end of each season. Uh, we were more successful uh, with survey responses in the fall than in the winter and spring. Uh, I, I can't tell you why, other than we were the statistics show we had more responses in the fall. Uh, stewardship goal was set to fully implement online ticketing for all events by August 22nd. We have fully implemented online ticketing, but we are not cashless. So we have the system in place. Uh, it is still a work in progress. Um, we offer uh, paper tickets at the gate still. Um, we need to develop and we're in the process of developing point of sales technology system right now. We have some kinks at Memorial Field with internet connection that we're trying to work through so we can get that system kind of rolling uh, for all of our events. But uh, right now it works a little better in our indoor venues than our outdoor venues. Uh, another goal was to fully implement online payment for officials and event workers um, by September, 2021. And we have fully implemented that um, with very, very few exceptions. That's, that's working well. And then the uh, fourth goal uh, was an anti-racism goal. The activities department will actively work to support the high schools improve uh, high school's improvement plan, anti-racism goal, and the department continues to actively support that. Some key reflections from last year. Um, student participation was strong. We had over 1,600 registrations for NS NHS activities, which I think is pretty amazing, and 990 unique registrants. Um, that does include some middle schoolers that were in high school programs. But uh, if you look at our school size and have 990 different students participating in our programs, it's pretty impressive. Uh, another reflection was student participation or student participants achieved at a high level. We had uh, several big nine championship teams, uh, girls cross country, wrestling, boys and girls hockey, boys and girls golf, and boys lacrosse all won big nine championships. Wrestling and girls hockey won section championships and went to state. Our boys swimming team won the section true, true team championship and ended up third at state. Uh, Nate Stevens won his second consecutive uh, boys golf individual championship. Our mock trial team was regional champions and our knowledge bowl team was conference and section champions and placed fourth at state. And we had many, many state participants that are linked there. And uh, another key reflection was student participants achieved at a high level in the classroom. We had gold academic recognition for many of our teams, girls tennis, girls swim and dive, girls basketball, gymnastics, boys track and girls track. And we had silver recognition for our football team, our girls Nordic and boys Nordic, our boys swim and dive, boys Alpine and girls Alpine teams. And that recognition is usually through their high school, their coaches association um, or the high school league. This year, 2022-23 uh, school improvement plan goals. We've chosen to focus on three pieces, family engagement, with setting a goal of 80% of respondents will rate their child's overall experience in, in the program a four or five or four or better on a five point scale at the end of the season survey. Uh, we feel this uh, supports the strategic uh, plan benchmark number nine, where all parents report satisfaction with their children's educational experience. We have a learner outcome goal of 80% of participants will agree or strongly agree that, quote, my participation in the sport activity has helped me feel connected to my school and our community. Again, this supports strategic plan benchmark number two that says all students are connected to the community. And number four, all students exhibit physical, social, and emotional well being. And then our third goal we're focusing on is our anti racism goal. Uh, our, it's a bleacher captain goal, which we can talk about maybe in, in, during the discussion or a question phase, but uh, that spectator supervisors will report positive student spectator behavior at 100% of NHS home events. And that connects nicely with NHS staff improvement goal, which you'll learn about shortly, uh, that staff and students will address 100% of racist behaviors and comments within one school day, and we'll work together to stand up and support others. So how do we get there? Uh, we've got a couple strategies in place. Uh, for goal number one, uh, the goal will be and has been shared with all coaches prior to their season. Parent engagement 
season ending surveys will be sent out through email and available online at the end of each season. Goal two, the coaches will be encouraged through intentional team building exercises and relationship building to develop student connectedness. Student surveys will be again sent out through email or linked at the end of season meetings for each sport. And our anti-racism goal, uh, our bleacher captains, we've trained our bleacher captains on acceptable behaviors and what if situations. Uh, we have, a, we have a, implemented a spectator supervisor position and spectator supervisor is a staff member that uh, attends games and sits with the sits with the students and usually in many events there's also an administrator there to help them remain positive to help our bleacher captains uh, work with our cheerleaders and lead in a positive way um, and that spectator supervisor will uh, at the, uh, the games they work will fill out a, a survey and will will hopefully gain some data on uh, how things went and what went well and what are some things to improve on Uh, our NHS activities is an integral part of the educational experience for many of our students and families. It's a key connector between the school and the community. I'm proud to, uh, of, of the mul multitude of sports, fine arts, activities, and clubs that we offer. As you know, we have some major needs and facilities and upgrading the ones we do have. I know our coaches will continue to strive to provide first-class programs for our students that will reflect well on the school and community. Thank you for your time and we'll take some questions. Thank you so much, Bubba. Any questions or comments from board members? Oh. Thanks, Bubba. Um, do you do student surveys of non-sports activities too? Good question. We have our overall student engagement surveys um, that that uh, you know, everybody has an opportunity to take. Um, we, from my office, have not done non-school ones so far that I am that I'm aware of. Non-sport or non-sport thing. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Um. And another question: the uh, data. Some of the students mentioned something about financial aid concerns. Um, are those? I guess I don't know what the status of that is, but yeah. Um, I can help with that a little bit. We have you know different levels that if kids qualify for free and reduced lunch that also helps them. Uh, we have a couple different levels of payment for activities. So there's obviously full full range and there's uh, there's two other ranges that uh, students with financial need can access. Yeah. Okay, good question, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for your report, Bubba. Um, are you confident with uh, kind of your outreach and your promotion for, I mean, I'm, with activities and sports just to encourage as many kids as possible to participate in, in things? And I know that we've had high percentages um, in the past, is there any kind of benchmark or um, ideas you have towards that? Well, I, that's a good question. And I think coming out of COVID, if we looked at participation numbers last year and, and, or two years ago and last year, they're, they're, they're up quite a bit. And so, yeah, we wanna hopefully continue that. Um, you know, a, a concern is with sports and activities is, uh, especially at the youth levels and as they get more expensive, uh, kids can sort of get caught cost it out. I, I don't know if that's the best way to say it. So I think at the high school level and at the middle school level, if we can continue to provide affordable programs for kids to get back in sometimes, uh, I think that's a key. But you're right, we need to promote that and and uh, make sure kids and families know that, hey, these, there's, there's opportunities, even though maybe you stop something at a younger age. Anyone else? Any Welcome, Baba. Thanks, Glad Amy. to have you in our, your new capacity. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I have two questions and a comment. Okay. First, would you explain the gold and silver recognition? Sure. Yeah. And it's I, I did I specifically didn't put numbers in there because it changes for different sports. For example, uh, a football team. If a football, uh, when they put, we will put our entire roster in our GPAs for each kid for their the previous year. And if the team GPA is 3.0 or better that's a silver recognition. If it's 3.5 or better, that's gold. For the other sports, um, the numbers are higher. The gold recognition is often like 3.75 or better, and the silver is 3.5 or better. So it depends a little bit on different sports, but you, as a coach, you would nominate, put your team in, include their GPAs, and then that sports association, the coach association will sort of uh, reward those great that's GPAs. That's the current quarter. And that's for the, it's, uh, when I was coaching football, it was in the last year's full year. So, yeah. Okay, that's the first question. Yes. Uh, my second question is, 
you mentioned cheerleaders, and I have this memory that we got rid of the cheerleading program. So I just was wondering what the status is. So if you'll recall, there were two uh, activities that we shifted from being under the activities department supervision to community education, uh, chess and cheer. And we are running both of those programs. And my understanding is there are seven people signed up for cheer. So those students, if you didn't know that it was now being run through community education, you wouldn't notice it's the same coach. It's the got a lot of the same things. There are a few um, items that we're ironing out of just having a different governance model. But uh, as Bubba said, we do have our cheer team at most of our activities so far. Uh, they typically do some fall sports and a little bit of winter. It, it depends on uh, how many students sign up, how many activities they're willing to attend. So cheer is still there. It's just running through community education as opposed to being under the auspice of the district uh, activities department. They were there in the rain the other night at the Mayo game, uh, football down there. So I yes. saw them in the parade yeah. on yes. Sunday. Yeah, which... good. And, yeah. and so just to be clear, yeah. in the past, those activities, chess and uh, cheer, which were part of the budget prioritization process, were funded from the general fund. When we shifted them to community education, they are no longer funded from the general fund, and they're basically totally um, funded on the fees that those students pay, which are substantially higher this year than what they would have been in the past, and in some cases, donations. I understand that the chess club raised $4,000 uh, in donations through our district online uh, donation portal to be able to add to their program so that cheer can uh, get on the bus with you know a football team or those things. Chess needs to take a, a, its own separate transportation. So those will operate very similarly to how they did in the past, but through community ed and not being funded from the general fund. Thank you. And then I have my comment. Uh, so as you're starting your here in your new position and you're thinking of how you want to make a mark on the programs that you have, I have an idea for you. And that is, I love seeing all of the different competitions that the um, different activities had won the, and the titles that they have. But I would also like to see um, some thought giving to the more cooperative activities and less competitive activities. Competitive activities are in some ways easier to measure, um, but the cooperative activities actually do a lot, um, you know, where they have like Rock and Roll Revival has hundreds of students and they have seven sold out shows and, and because they are cooperating, they have really accomplished something. The Link students, same thing. The um, uh, Art Night, uh, I don't know what all falls under your purview, but if you could also think in terms of not only the competitive side, but cooperative successes, I would love to see that next year. Yeah, great, thank you. Anyone else? Julie. Thanks, Bubba. I think it's great that we've added the um, high school activities to the to the school improvement plan. So it's it's really great to see this report. Um, I have two questions. Um, one, well, question and a comment. My first question is around the family engagement goals. So you were talking about how they're rating their child's overall experience. What are some of the types of questions or um, metrics you'll do to measure experience? How is that being defined? Good question. And it's really, that's in the works, Julie. We we don't have the survey done yet. Actually, Leah Sand is helping me with that. Uh, and we're, it's one of our projects we're working on right now, but um, it's a great question. And I don't have a great answer for you yet. No, I and I, I think you'll get there for sure. Yeah. I, yeah. I'm really happy to see that goal. I think it's, it's a really great, a strong goal. My um, second comment was I was fortunate enough to re, uh, receive an email over the weekend from the Booster Club, the president of the Booster Club. And I really liked the message that he gave to, it went out to anyone that I think has ever been part of Booster Club. But I think when we talk about um, being able to provide um, scholarships for students, they are a huge part of that. And I think the email really did describe the great work that the Booster Club does, and it's significant. I know the dollars that the Booster Club is able to support scholarships is always been hugely significant. So I appreciate that um, they're doing a little bit different outreach for that and really explaining 
the importance of the program. And really, I, I would imagine that they'll have some good response to that email because it was well written and it talked about all the people that are involved in that program. And there's certainly names that I think people would recognize and be able to, you know, just have conversations with or so that was really good to see because we are, we are very grateful for the work of the booster club and those scholarships are significant and, uh, and another way that we can continue I, I love that the data summit came out with let's be sure that we aren't allowing, you know, or having people who are interested students interested falling through the cracks and I think to be able to offer scholarships is a huge piece of that. Yeah, and I agree. The booster club is key to running, you know, their, their extra help and financial help and and organizational help is key in so many of our programs. Good, thank you. Well, excellent report. So Thanks. thank you. Yeah. Take care. Thanks, oh, Corey had a question oh. for you. Yeah, one quick follow up concerning participation. Makes sense that participation be up over the last couple of years. Do we have a sense for how it compares to 2018, 19, or prior years? Good question. Um, I don't have the data for that, but. Um, I don't know if any if, if uh, any Matt has any any sense of that. We'll need to go back and take a look at that participation and then compare. It. And I think it is difficult. I think we all want to go back and compare pre-pandemic to post-pandemic. I do think it's a very difficult. There's I think something Bubba put in the presentation is important. You read a couple of things where it says there is no baseline data. Right. None of us have been alive when we have started to come out of a major global health emergency. So being a data and metric person, I, of course, want to go back to pre-pandemic levels, but I'm not sure how effectively we can. Um, we certainly can use that data. I'm not sure if we can make good meaning from it. We are resetting, let me say that in our, our baselines for this year, totally appropriate for us to take a look at those. But I think the world that students are signing up for right now is not the same world that they were signing up for in the fall of 2019. So we can certainly provide that data in a follow-up um, I do think it will be interesting to see what are the participation levels and how does participation change amongst how it was pre in terms of the kinds of activities that students participate in pre-pandemic and what kinds of things they participate in post-pandemic. And I know that when you hear from what you heard from Bubba tonight and when you hear from the high school administrative team in just a few minutes, making sure that kids are connected in whatever way is important for them is what we need to do. It's we, we have to shift our mindset of what do we think that kind of connection is. We have to ask the kids what are the kinds of connections they want and do the best that we can meet do to meet them where they're at. So more to come. Good. Thank okay. you, Bubba. Thank you. Appreciate you. All right. Now we have our high school principal, Shane Beyer, with the continuous improvement plan for the high school. Welcome, Shane. Yes. yes. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for uh, the opportunity to speak tonight. On behalf of the high school, I have a couple of folks with me tonight. Uh, part of our, our admin team, I have Rico Warren here and Becca Bang is our newest member of the team. And I appreciate uh, hearing Bubba's vision for the activities department. So, you know, we are, are kind of our kickoff for the year was, you know, one school, one team, one dream, right? We are really interested in coming together as a team to to you know, create a vision for the high school that's consistent with uh, the vision for the school district. And, and what's interesting is I'm looking at the first two slides in this presentation. It was the same two slides we had in our class meetings that we've been doing for the last two weeks. So as of Wednesday of this week, we'll have gone to every classroom, one of the three of us with our counselor and spending about 45 minutes really, uh, really reshaping the vision for a high school and what role we play in it, what role our students play in it, and really helping to be on the same page with uh, the vision for, for the future. So I'm waiting for the slides to show up here. Do I see control that? with your- Oh, there perfect, you okay. Yeah. So again, the vision, you've, you've heard it. Uh, our students have heard it. Uh, our staff, we were in workshop, we heard it, right? It's really the, the blueprint for moving forward. And I appreciate the work that's been done to put that vision out in front of people. Similar to that is the, is the commitments. You know, talking to students today about we value people, we value learner outcomes. And the program we have at the high school is really designed to help support you as a student. And these outcomes really are critical in our decision-making every day. And as far as moving forward, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm new to this arena of high school principal in Northfield, but what I'm not new to is, is this idea of leadership and the importance of it. And so when I think about leadership, I, the, the participatory leadership model really uh, grabs my attention because if you look at the words within that description, it's really about engagement of all. And I think about our students that are here tonight. 
uh, they're absolutely a critical part of our of our of our, our team. And in fact, the class meetings at the end of the class meetings this week and last, it, it, we're really challenging students to consider being a part of our principal advisory council that we're planning to start. It will be happening monthly, and we're taking six seniors, uh, four juniors, four sophomores, and and two ninth graders to be part of that team. And it's really about looking at this experience we call high school. Right? I've lived it once. I was pretty good at it, but I really it's not about me going back to high school. It's about helping our current students. Live, their, live out their dreams and help them be ready for something beyond high school, whatever that might be for them. So with that being said, uh, I have, I'm gonna turn it over to my teammates here and we'll come back at the end. Thank you. We'll uh, do a 21, 22 goals review. And this is um, something as I uh, was there in 21, 22 and, and uh, helped write these and, and do these looking forward with the new team. and really looking at equity and 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 uh, what we're digging in right now it's really surreal to me so it's a, it's, it's a wonderful wonderful school year um just looking at that students of color and advanced level courses will be representative of the demographic of students at nhs we do have an open ap system what are we doing to get those kids in there to recruit quarterly referrals um we talked about odrs today and 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 really have a streamlined um way to record those for our teachers and the capture data. We really wanna see our students of color will be represented again of the demographics of students at NHS. So um, that's uh, very important. Uh, switching to student set, uh, satisfaction. Um, most teachers care about and are interested in me as a person. Um, teachers at my school care about students. Those are two huge questions that we all in the, in the schools need to how to improve each and every year. Um, uh, it, again, going back to the goal here, as we look at uh, students of color and advanced level courses, I'll get to the student uh, satisfaction in a minute, but uh, developing strong uh, PLC teams, and that's something that, uh, again, that we are really putting emphasis on. Core instruction, core instruction to help drive that. Um, is great. Uh, systems of support, MTSS is stronger than ever uh, going forward to help students develop growth mindset and their academic potential. Um, the second goal, again, of the students of color will be representative of the demographics uh, in terms of uh, referrals. Um, relationships are the cornerstone of everything and, and of this and continuing to, again, like Dr. Hillman said, Students can see themselves in what we are teaching. They students can see themselves um, uh, in good relationships with with teachers and so forth, and just the connectedness. What are we offering for for students? Um, this is great. Ninety five percent of all students will agree strongly or agree uh, that teachers at the school care about students. So in the spring of 2022, 88% of all students agreed with the statement. I know a lot of teachers personally were very, very happy with this. And uh, that just drove them to even look at the next year and to make that percentage even higher. 70% um, uh, will report that most teachers care about them. Okay, In the spring of 2020, 85% of students agreed with this statement. Um, I know that uh, students of color was at an 83% um, for this goal. Um, and that's something that we are really looking to improve as we go forward. So you heard a little bit about um, where we were this year with a lot of changes coming out of a pandemic and many new members of the team, including myself. Um, we thought about some of the same some alignment with some of the district strategic goals and some things that were um, we were really recognizing as an opportunity for growth for our school. Forgive the scratchy throat. It was a lot of cheering on the first day of school. Um, first, we aligned our academic goal with some of the work that we are seeing as a need across the district coming out of a pandemic. We've seen a large number of our students um, needing support from credit recovery. And when we think about academic success post high school, one of those check marks, right, is that you're on the right path. And so we are looking at within our achievement and integration plan, really recognizing that from any different demographic data that we can pull that our students 
are on the right track with that regard. So we had a lot of really great conversation about this. You probably recall, we just heard previously, we were really focused on just AP enrollment, but now as we're coming out of this different space and time, we're really thinking about supporting all of our students, not just those maybe achieving at the highest levels and wanting to make sure we've got supports in place to set our students up for success. Um, again and again, you're gonna hear from us about our commitment to equity work. And that's gonna show up here too in our anti-racism and inclusivity goal. Um, you already heard from Bubba, it's, it's not some, it's not most, it's 100%. Anytime that we have um, a situation that causes students to feel like they've been harmed because of an identity, we're gonna respond to it. One of the things that we are working on is getting some alignment and creating some more systematic procedures so that we make sure that our students are responded to, that those key stakeholders are informed about what is happening um, and, that, and that we take the appropriate steps to repair the harm that has happened. So we already are doing a lot of those things across the district. We were talking about, you know, we contact Dr. Hillman and then he contacts, you know, we've got these things in place but it's not written out, it's not a roadmap, it's not super clear each turn by turn direction. And so we're looking to do a little bit more alignment with that work um, to make sure that we're responding every single time in the best way that we can to support all of our students and families. Um, another kind of continuing goal for us is connected to those ODRs or office discipline referrals. Um, we were working towards eliminating that discrepancy and it still exists. So one of the things you kind of already heard is we're looking to utilize our Skyward system so that we can do more data polls at a quarterly basis to start recognizing, monitoring, and adjusting at a faster rate, maybe than what's been done in the past to make sure that each student group is represented appropriately. Now, ideally none, right? But we know that if nothing else, we want to make sure that we're not seeing overrepresented groups within those office discipline referrals. Something else that we're doing that connects to both of those goal you already heard about from Mr. Byer is really taking a proactive approach. So in our class meetings with every single student in our school, we are talking about what does it look like to respond to different situations? We're talking about what does it look like to interrupt and to support all different student groups. Um, and our mission and vision is listed right there. And I know in, in the presentation that I've spoken to, we really do speak to being social justice advocates through the lens of education. So those kinds of things we are taking proactive approaches to as well. Our family engagement goal is to have 100% of our parents or guardians receiving individualized messages. Um, I was talking to a sister-in-law not too long ago and my nephew who's in the fourth grade shared with me that he's just like this top-notch student. I'm definitely bragging, but it's true. He's amazing. And the thing is, she's never gotten a parent phone call home. Right. So that's got to be over. We got to be connecting with all of our students, all of our families. Part of that is our parent engagement night. Our percentage of participation wasn't quite as high as we would love for it to be. We know sometimes in high school that looks differently, though. And one of the things we are really excited about is our newsletter that's going out weekly right now has about 2000 hits or more every single week. And the content that we're putting in front of our students, including our class meetings, including some updates to our attendance plans and responses are all built within that. And so I do feel like we're doing some really strategic things to connect with our community, connect with our families and helping them feel informed. Um, and I think we can reflect on that first engagement night and think differently about how we can maybe even increase those rates. Um, but a part of that, like I said, is that one-on-one -on -one communication we are putting things out in multiple languages. We're utilizing different resources to make sure that all of our families feel connected and well communicated with. And finally, our employee engagement goal is around the principal or supervisor that will consult staff members in decisions that affect their job. And you've already heard, we're looking at a community leadership paradigm. If you haven't heard it already, I am confident you will hear from staff members at the high school that we are working together to rethink what ought to be and really trying to transform our school community so that all folks feel like their voices are heard when we're making decisions that affect them. So those are some of the things um, that we're working on on our school improvement plan this year. And you probably are noticing a lot of alignment with the district strategic goals. Some of the action steps or strategies that we're taking, I've already spoken to a little bit and you've heard in different places. 
In terms of that achievement, we're really focusing in on those professional learning communities. We've had a district-wide or district-level PLC team come together and set some guidance for what our PLC teams will look like. Um, and our administrative team is joining those PLCs every week to be a support and to offer some guidance. In terms of our social emotional learning, we're integrating a new screening process. We actually ended up adding some questions about feeling connected to the school community to that survey to make sure that we're getting the data we need to really drive our actions. Um, and you've already heard a little bit about that family engagement as well, those two personalized feedback messages. Um, and then if it's just a semester class, it is that one. So I know already that a lot of our teachers go beyond this, but part of the purpose is not, is not just to have one touch on a student, but to really make sure all of our students and families feel that connection um, in addition with that newsletter communication from us. When we think about our strategies for anti-racism, we're really trying to implement more restorative practices. So that's been a part of our class meetings as well, sharing with students what they can anticipate um, and hosting those essential or courageous conversations when students make mistakes. With our employee engagement, again, we're focusing in on that PLC model. We've been talking about unselfish, unselfish acts of leadership within our um, kind of rollout of our workshop week. And we're utilizing that participatory leadership paradigm. <laughs> questions that you might have. Yeah, thank you, board members. Any questions? Oh, um, thank you for this excellent report, voice and all. <laughs> A couple questions. Um, are we doing no suspensions? There's been talk of, as far as disciplinary things, of trying to avoid suspensions if possible. Well, I, I think I think that that's always a goal is not to have kids in, not in school. But we also recognize when there's health and safety kinds of things, that sometimes that, that, that break from school temporarily is, is a part of that, but it's certainly not our go-to. Um, you know, as you heard a little bit about some of the you know, restorative practices, you know, building strong relationships on the front end. And so that you can lean into that when you have students with difficulties. Today, we talked that we had our uh, training kind of skyward for entering discipline referrals for staff. And we just talked about what's a major referral, what's a minor referral, right? And how do you, how do you discern the difference between those two? And a lot of times it's based on relationships, what, what, what your response might be. You know, a minor, a minor behavior is, is different from a major simply in intensity or maybe frequency over time. But ultimately, our goal is for teachers to have great relationships with students and proactively step in the gap in that, and, and see that what's what's not working for the student and, and seek out seek them out proactively to find out what's not working rather than waiting for a big event to occur. So it's it's really foundationally built on relationships and then practices that help support a resolution that's a win-win and keeps the kid in school ultimately is what we're after. Okay. Um, and then you talked about a principal advisory council. Can you talk more about that? Yeah, I think, gosh, the students are just, that just made my day. I mean, I had a great day to begin with, but hearing the, hearing the three of them talk and I have not connected with them yet, this can kind of a busy fall getting launched here, but I know who I'll be talking to soon. Yeah, but the, the principal advisory council tr is just truly that. It's about bringing student voice intentionally uh, into the picture. I, I recognize and I value surveys, uh, but, but that's oftentimes at the end of the game. And I, I just assume affect the game that we're in. Uh, the outcome is something you can't change when it occurs, but I can change the steps that we're taking toward that outcome to maybe change it. And so a monthly connection with students that are invested in making positive change in our school can't be nothing but a good thing. And so we'll, we'll, we'll talk about um, much of that agenda can be driven by student voice and input on things that they are concerned about but, but beyond that it'll be about you know just on climate culture greater pride things systems that are in place that maybe aren't working for students or those that are we want to even get, make better which is kind of what they talked about tonight what their their discussion will fit right into that as a vehicle and how do you pick the students in in, in the, the question or my concern or point is um you you, ha you have student leaders and there's more maybe the more outgoing whatever and then you have the quiet ones mm -hmm. and the, they have just as much you know perspective on things is there a way to connect with them as much as the the uh the student leaders 
Yeah, so in the, I, don't, I don't have it up here, but I have two slides in our presentation for, for class meetings and, and one of the slides really gets at that, which is really picking a diverse set of students. Like who, who's represented in this high school that could be represented on this team of 20 people? And we're gonna, we're gonna have a quick application process. Like tell me what's, why you might be a good person for this position, for this leadership job. And the second question might be what kind of the kinds of things that you've been doing that would help you be a great leader. And so then we'll just usually use our connections with, with staff and with to know students who have a unique interest and a unique perspective that we want at the table. So we have a diverse set of um, experiences that, and, and perspectives that, that can help us grow and hear from that quiet voice that who probably has a lot to say, given the right opportunity. Thank you. Anyone else comments or questions? No. A college English teacher would tell me I'm the last person should talk about the choice of words, but you use the word enrollment on minoritized students. And I think minoritized is a verb rather than a noun. I use that. Are you speaking minority students? I think, <clears throat> I think that that's a goal from last year, Noel. So um, it was just- not his responsibility? Correct, yes. It was, a, it was a goal, previous goal, but- You changed that. Yeah. No, yeah. I got that changed and taken out. You must have had a previous copy too. I got the copy. Uh, good question. Yeah. yeah. Good question. Thank you. Yeah, we want to use parallel language in our, in our presentations for sure. Thank you. Okay. No, is that it? You have a follow up? You good? No. Okay. I don't have a follow up. Mm. I have trouble with the one question. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome, Becky and Shane, and welcome back, Rico. I have to say, I loved your presentation. It made me very delighted to have you in leadership positions. And I really look forward to seeing where you take the high school because it looks like you have lots of ideas. And I'm particularly excited about your equity and engagement goals. Um, so just throwing that out there, I, I wanna, can't wait till next year to see what you do with all of that. I do have a question though, since we're the group that came up with the vision and the strategic commitments, and you've been the ones talking to the students about them. Mm -hmm. What did the students say about our, our vision and our commitments? Our, do they think we're crazy or do they have other ideas? Uh, well, that's, that's a good question. I think the format of our, of our engagement with them in this class meeting is much more sit and get and listen. There's definitely some interaction opportunities. Uh, one example is I have a little padlet where it's a basically a free response and it's displayed on the screen is, well, how do you, what, what's your definition of a leader, right? Which is getting at their understanding of what their role is. And we talk about the importance of that they are leader of self first. And then they, if they can take care of self, then they are able to be of service to other people, which is really one way of help, helping them to understand that every child being ready for success beyond high school is you gotta be, you gotta be, see yourself as a leader and a, and a change agent in this, in this society that needs some freshness, right? And some new ideas. And I think our, I think the generation that we're gonna be sending out into the, into the world is our best chance. Thank you. So it's put on your own mask first before you help your neighbor. It's a good plan. Thank you very much. Yeah. Any other comments? Julie, and then Jeff. I don't have any questions, just a comment. I love the energy and I think the report was really excellent and it's um, really impressive how you have really um, um, determined what the big, what your priorities should be for this coming school year. Cause there's a lot of them out there but I commend you for what you have, have really prioritized. And what I hear throughout the community is amazing things about the leadership team at the high school, whether it's faculty or parents. And I've heard from students too, they're all really excited about the energy that you three, and in addition to Bubba as well, obviously, um, as a leadership team. So um, again, we're really looking forward to the great things that will happen at the high school this year. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Jeff. I just wanted to thank you for your report and just encourage you on, on a great year and, and uh, you know, you'll do a good job. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, Jeff. thank you. Anyone else? Yes, thank you so much for your report. We appreciate you. We're so lucky to have you. Thank I you. have one question for sure. you. Um, are the, you know, we heard that the students very much want to be involved in um, the decisions and want to be involved in um, 
the the process. And I'm wondering, did the student? I know the families um, get a newsletter or two. Um, do the students get that kind of communication? We send the same newsletter to them, right? And then we also we just were talking today about you know kind of a, no, a more, morning announcement structure that gives that more granular day to day things that are upcoming. Um, you know, sometimes that's student led. Uh, announcements because they have things they want to share with the student body. Other times it'll be us. But yeah, they, they are receiving the same uh, newsletters. In fact, I think the the other day, not the last one, but the previous uh, newsletter got 20, 2,800 views. So people are viewing them, which is great. And our, we just got to make sure the content continues to be, you know, precise and clear and not, you know, sometimes less is more. So we're just trying to be mindful of people's time. High school is a tricky one to get people to show up. Uh, I know that the 25% of people that did show up were happy, but it's the other 75% that found something else to do the, those evenings or those days that I'm wondering how we can connect with. Um, but the newsletter has been one, one tool that I've been really pleased with thus far, and we'll continue to, to, to do that. In fact, I've had a, a few folks who have been really intentional about feedback on how they appreciated the, the, du the dual language, the translations, and, and, and those looking equally the same. Right, like, uh, and that's really been intentional. Great. Um, I guess I do have another question on the office discipline referrals. How are those counted? Does it is it counted as an office referral when the student gets to the office, or is it a communication from the classroom teacher? At what point do you count that as the referral? Yeah, that was that's a great question. So that was part of our discussion today, and will be kind of ongoing as a staff. But when it becomes, if it's a if it's a significant concern, health health and safety kind of thing. And a teacher submits through Skyward office referral, it, it goes to the team. Uh, the other option, of course, is if a student, we observe something and they're not in the classroom, could be another office referral if it's, if it's of significant nature. Oftentimes, it's a, it's a coaching conversation, right? It's about this is, not how we, this is not how we operate. This is not the right or way. And we have a conversation. Sometimes that's restorative in nature. Like let's right. We all make mistakes. We all say things sometimes that don't line up with with our community values, and some reflection around that, and uh, rest, rest, restitution or restoring that is is part of what makes our community strong. Thank you so much. You want to add something? No. Oh, okay. Great. Yeah. Go ahead. All right. Well, thanks so much. Oh yeah. The three, yeah. The three R's: restitution, resolution, reconciliation. reconciliation right. We got, that we talked about today. Um, Spend some time talking about the Constitution today, right? The Bill of Rights matters. That's the why behind all that we do, right? We want to protect your rights and recognize that you have responsibilities to go with those and, and really uh, want to make sure that we are you know, showing up in a way that's going to help this high school be amazing. Thank you. I will say, too, as much as you might think that a, like a class presentation on rules can be pretty dry, like, when we talk about students' rights and their hopes and dreams and how why we're here is all connected to that, we do get the head nod. Like, yeah, this is about every student and that we do need to make some changes to do a better job. And so um, sometimes at 7.30, 15-year-olds don't give you a lot of jazz back, mm -hmm. but but we're seeing those kind of nonverbals and and um, some participation throughout to know that they're with us and that they understand the value and are committed to doing this together. Just, just one a little uh, story to that end. So today at the end of my senior class meeting, did a little assessment as, as, we, as we talked about what, is, what makes a leader. And they you know, described that and showed me and they were able to display their answers. And it certainly aligned with my own beliefs on leadership. And they recognize that they too are leaders. At the end was a slide that talks about creating a culture of leadership and excellence. And what's included in that is when, when, you're, when, when you're alone, when students are in the hallways or in the lunchroom, there aren't a lot of adults around, right? Keeping the language clean, being able to respond, be responsive to adults when they do approach you, like creating that kind of a, a place where people want to be, you know, like getting the, the fist to five. Like five, zero means we have a lot of work to do. Like we're in trouble and five is we're amazing. And kids are very honest about where they are. I said, they, they were like a three. And so, so who's going to make the change? And they're like we are, right? So they, they recognize they're they they are empowered to be leaders and they're expected to be leaders. And so hopefully that three does go to a four or five. Thanks so much. Yeah, thank you. you. Okay, next we have Hope Langston giving us an instructional services update. 
So I was told I had 10 minutes. You know how hard that is. <laughs> All right, I'm happy to be here tonight. Um, following that class act right there. Um, so tonight we're gonna provide a brief update on the instructional services team and the work that we're doing. Please know that the, the data review that comes with the MCAs and related data around world's best workforce will be part of my presentation to you in November. So tonight we're gonna talk about summer work teams and then some other areas of focus for the department this year. So you've seen a lot of missions this tonight, and uh, I'm just going to refresh your memory about the mission of our department to strive for excellence in teaching and learning with a commitment to maximizing student outcomes within a system of continuous improvement. So we are really supporting our buildings and our teachers and um, with the ultimate goal of raising student achievement for all students. So again, um, we are in entering year three. Of, of this new model of um, assessment and teaching and learning, what was formerly teaching and learning. So there's a lot under our umbrella and we are working to A, learn about all of these pieces and then B, think about how we can streamline and improve um, district operations related to them. So I'm gonna give a huge shout out to Val, to Molly, um, to the building principals, because it, because it's a steep learning curve, and we, um, they have been instrumental in helping us understand the scope of our work and how it relates to district operations. So we spoke about our summer work teams last year, and that was our inaugural year of that model. Um, this year, you'll see fewer teams, but really important work that was done. So teams were again um, involving an application process. Teachers applied to be on them. We were very transparent about um, the deliverables, the goals of the teams, and how much it costs the district actually for, for us to, to um, put together one of these teams and the hours that are involved. So we had core performance expectations that was led by Dr. Hillman. We had a workshop week team that was led by Sam Richardson, family engagement, and that was Sarah Pratt. PLC process was facilitated by me, um, as was the K-5 math team and the K-5 literacy team um, with the help of uh, Alicia Clary. And then Carrie Duba worked with the SEL team and the MTSS process team. So these were the key teams this summer. Again, I, I can't, this is like the best part of my job um, is working with, with staff to, to make our district better and just getting a lot of ideas put on the table and then coming to a consensus for what we can do together to improve what, what's happening for kids. So priorities for 22-23, we are in the second year of a resurrected content and instructional review cycle. So we learned some things in the first year, um, things we did well, things we need to get better at. Um, so this year we will be working with 612 English Language Arts, um, the music department and family and consumer science and business. The teams that worked last year, which is science um, at the middle school, um, PE and health, um, they will continue their work this next year. The middle school science did adopt a new curriculum. So they have made the standard shift where earth science is being taught in sixth grade. Our next um, team to work with on that standard shift for science will be the high school. Um, but we're excited, really excited to look at 612 ELA as well for some vertical alignment and, and just in looking at the holistic view of what we're, what we're teaching and learning in um, English language arts at the secondary school. District MTSS, shout out to Carrie. Um, we, we were one of 12 districts out of 50 applicants who were awarded um, an MTSS grant. It comes with a lot of guidance from the state and a lot of pieces to think about. Um, and Carrie's just done an amazing job working with building leadership teams. And we are excited to see where that process takes us. And then um, our third focus is surrounding the PLC process and the targeted professional development. So the PLC team, um, 
And that was a, a group that had very divergent views at the start of the process, really came together nicely um, about what PLCs should look like and what our needs were. And there's real focus on, on training about the PLC process um, and how we can embed that in the Wednesday work and also how to keep um, this the, the equitable focus on all students at the forefront. And um, so we say PLC is equity work and equity work is PLC work. And this is, um, this is really the focus. How do we get more students to grade level benchmarks? And then targeted professional development. We're excited to um, work with each building principal on what their specific needs are and what the PLC teams identify as their needs for additional support from the instructional services team. I do want to mention one other thing. We have Rebecca Glazing who joined our team this year, and we are really excited because it fits so nicely with so much of the work we do around um, curriculum development. And so we are happy to have her join our team and bring her expertise to, to our group as well. So did I make it? Woo. Much time. All right. Thanks for that questions. Good presentation. It's a lot. Are there any questions or comments from the members? I just want to comment uh, briefly on the work teams. Uh, so I will talk about the work teams as part of the state of the district as well. But routinely in our employee engagement survey, you saw this throughout all of our school improvement plans. Our staff uh, has brilliance. We have a you know staff who are just truly brilliant, and they would like to have more input into the decisions that are made within the school system. And as I share with people and talk with them, we talk about level of decision making. Right? What's a level one decision and what's a level three decision? And so I describe a level one decision as, that, as this, that all folks who are interested in getting up at 4 a.m. to check the country roads with me to decide whether or not we're going to have school are welcome. Um, that's a level one decision. People want Matt Hillman making that call, right? So we talk about that. Then we talk all the way to the part about um, where we are truly having that consultative role and involving lots of people as part of that decision making. And that's really where the work teams come. We have over 600 employees in the district. There's no way we can do a show of hands on every decision that has to be made. But the work teams are the integral part. And what Hope has shared, this is what was her idea of how do we do this? We work together, her idea, we work together. How do we resource it? Because if we really want these things to be effective, we have to resource it. That means we have to pay people to come in outside of their uh, contract time. The other things that are really important are about giving those work team parameters within the confines of the strategic plan. Here is the way that you're going to go about helping us solve this complex problem. Here's the deliverable that you have to have. And I really want to emphasize what Hope shared that we put the dollar amount on how much is it costing the district to make this decision. And so I don't, I can't think of a work team in the first two years of this where the administrative team has not been able to support overall what the work team. Uh, brought forward. So as we think about moving from being a very a quality organization to an excellent organization, this is how we are lifting the voice of our staff members and the results speak for themselves. Let's just take the workshop week, for example. Uh, if you're, we were, let's just say the feedback that we got in 2021 was less than positive about how we scheduled workshop week. Workshop week is really important because it is the launching pad for the school year. And if the school year launches well, that gives us the energy to get to the first day of school. You have a great first day of school. Then you look back on that Friday of the first week of school and you say, I'm tired, but boy, was that awesome. The flywheel is spinning. We brought together people this summer to talk about what would the workshop week look like if you were to rate it as a five out of five. And when we surveyed people after 86% of over 200 respondents said that they were either completely satisfied or I think their term was somewhat satisfied, satisfied. or completely satisfied. So the fact is that this is an example of how you take, we could have, oh my gosh, the sky is falling. People are really upset. You know, I mean, we get data back that was not fun to hear, but we didn't whine about it. We didn't complain about it. We leaned into it. We asked for feedback. We brought the people who the decisions affect to the table. We had them help us design it. And the result is nothing short than amazing. So we gloss over it with the work team piece a little bit, 
but that's a real world example of how the uh, how a work team can make a difference for the people who are doing this really important work because guess what when our adults feel successful they are going to give their best work for kids so well done hope hope any questions or comments mm -hmm. I'm just wondering if you would talk about the teams a little bit, how many people are on them, what the composition of the teams are, how they're chosen. That's sure. So we had, we, we actually had fewer applicants this year than last year. Um, I think it was a combination of A, we had fewer teams and B, uh, people were, were very tired after last year. And, um, but we still had over 70 applicants and um, they, the application is pretty simple. You know, it has the goals of the team and the and um, and the basic information. But there, there, we ask them what, why would they be a good candidate for the team, and um, and then it's like a Tetris puzzle, kind of putting, making sure we have every building grade level represented on on each team. Um, the teams, I don't, I don't remember off the top of my head. I like my the PLC team had eight hours, and we had. 12 people on it um, and then team comes together to schedule their meetings um, and really it's um, it's a true collaborative effort to get from point a to the end game um, and and so the scope of the work depended on like matt's team i think your team just met for what three hours yeah so so the length of the commitment and the team size kind of depends on the work to be done. So it varies by team. Did I answer your question, Amy? Okay. Any other things or comments? Hope I had a question about how you decided um, what work teams to call together. That's a great question. So, so we knew we use our feedback basically, and we and we look for we knew workshop week was a was a, a place where we needed to do some improvement. We also knew the PLC team process was a place where we needed to, to relook at what we were doing. Um, the literacy and the math work and the SEL work um, really came out of work that was started last summer that we knew we needed to continue to evolve. Um, SEL is a huge need that we've identified in the district. So that was um, work we knew we needed to continue. And it ties in nicely with this MTSS um, leadership team that is part of this grant process. And then the core performance expectations um, really was tied to our studer work, um, but knowing that we really need a teacher voice in, in that process. And um, so we really look at the team formation based on um, how many we can have like financially and then also what are the i what are identified needs based on feedback for that for that school year thank you all right well julie well thank you hope for your presentation so once these work teams have accomplished their their goal and 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 achieved their deliverable is there any survey follow-up with them to see um their um you know, thoughts about the overall process and, and their participation? So we have not formally done that, but I, I really like that idea. And I think we should implement that actually. Um, they're not shy about giving their feedback um, and which makes this again, such a great process, but I think a more formalized collection of, of information around that would be a great idea. Okay, okay thank you so much, Hope. All right. I appreciate that. Okay, now we have Cheryl Hall, Director of Special Services, requesting a change in funding. Hey, Cheryl. Good evening. Thank you. I didn't think I would be back so soon. <laughs> uh, we continue to do some problem solving uh, for our staffing shortage shortages. And as you uh, saw in the um, request uh, for approval is a change in how we're utilizing our current staffing um, funding uh, for our positions. Uh, since we are short uh, some educational assistant positions, five at the high school, and uh, we, we thought that maybe we could find a teacher instead of 
uh, two to three educational assistants. So the costing there is um, approximately uh, three or is for three educational assistants and uh, to exchange that for one licensed teacher. Uh, depending on the, um, the level of experience that a teacher would come in at, um, our average cost is listed there at $85,021.20. And uh, that is for a teacher that is um, at MA Step 10, I believe is our average, right? MA, MA 10, Step 7, thank you. Val and I worked on this closely together. And uh, so um, if a teacher, it could be a less cost um, to hire a teacher uh, if they don't come in with um, that many years of experience or level of um, education. So um, we think that this might be uh, one way that we could solve our staffing issue. Uh, that would allow us with uh, quite a bit of flexibility because a, a teacher is providing the necessary instruction that we need, as well as having um, some knowledge and ability to also meet some of the other accommodations and modifications that a student might have or multiple students might have. Also, our numbers in our um, our caseload numbers in our EBD, Emotional Behavioral Disorders classes, uh, has gone up. And with that, in our setting 2-3, which uh, setting 2-3 serves students more than 60% of their day in a special education setting. With that, the state has a rule on the caseload limits there. And with that, with the increases we've seen this fall, we are over that caseload limit for our, our 1.5 teachers that we allocated to, to those to those um, needs, um, we now need uh, really to have uh, 2.0 teachers in that. And then we can allow the uh, extra 1.0 FTE to help support not only some of those students possibly, but others in the resource setting that, that they would be helping with to offset the reassignment. Thank you, Cheryl. Is that some more comments? I just wanna add that uh, again, we are, and you'll hear in the state of the district, you know, we are like lots of other, in fact, we're in much better shape than most districts with our staffing. But this is an area where, uh, again, we can either just lament that we haven't been able to fill these positions, or we can think differently about how we might be able to provide these services. So I just wanted to provide that summary of the really great work that Cheryl and Val have done to try to think through how we might, how we might differently provide the services for these students with special education needs rather than how we've just done in the past. So I really thank Cheryl and Val for thinking through what, what could we do differently to make sure that we can provide these students as with support. Thank you. And, and two, we're looking at a, a cost neutral um, approach to this. We're not trying to add anything more. We're trying to keep to our goal that we've had um, with uh, the, the, um, the new budget process that we're using and really look to see if we can find a way to do this without um, raising the, any further uh, debt for the school district and meet our student needs. Tom, you have a question? Uh, I had a question on the um, net cost um, and how you got those numbers, because uh, like 55% of the salary is 40,000 from 85 should be 45,000, but it's 32. Is there some other source of funding in there? The, the salary plus benefits is the 85,000. You don't see the cost, the just the salary amount and the, um, the percent, the 55% of the, just the salary is there. That's why it looks a little different. Except that, does that apply to the three EAs too? Because those numbers do add up. Yes, it does. Um, we can check that if, you know, to make sure that that's accurate. But probably not right now in the yeah, moment. Yeah, yeah. No, the math in front of other people. Yes. I think the key thing is what you're seeing, Tom, is that 
there are some things that we are able to get the reimbursement on and some things that we are not. And so I think what I'm hearing Cheryl say is that it, the it is in, and you're right, in one case, it does completely add up. In the other segment, it doesn't, we'll go back and validate those numbers. We're not asking for any approval tonight. We're simply sharing with you this potential approach. Um, and so I think the key thing is that there could also be some other different costs based on the different contracts that we'll validate. Yep, thanks. This is more of a hypothetical, should we be able to pull this off? This mm -hmm. is what it would look like. Okay, okay. Julie. Well, I always appreciate the way you're really working around the challenges you have, because I know they're just, it, it, it's a very challenging environment and you can't go to the state and say, oh, well, we put out postings and no one responded, so whatever. I mean, you really have to, have to do this and I just appreciate the, um, the approach. I think it's a really strong one. Um, of course, probably tied with filling EA positions is finding special ed teachers potentially. So, so what is your um, sort of um, anticipation of being able to fill this? And we always have to ask, I'll jump on this before Amy gets there, would it be helpful if we were to approve this tonight? So, Right, the, the shortage is real. Um, we, we do not know if we will be able to get a licensed teacher, um, especially a, a special education licensed teacher. Um, however, things always can change and uh, someone might become available that wasn't available earlier. And that's, we, we hope to do that. I guess um, my, my bottom line is like what you said, Julie, we, we can't just wait and see. Uh, we feel like we need to act and try to see if we can if we can make um, something different happen. Uh, there's also different tiers of licensure that that we could um, be potentially hire someone under, and and so that's what we would we would look to. Excellent, thank you. I just want to add to that that I agree with Cheryl totally that if we were to get a licensed special education teacher, we're all going to play the lottery, right? Because that's how rare that is right now. But I do think that the work that we've done to increase the base of our teacher contract really plays to our advantage here. So with a starting salary of around $50,000, just north of $50,000, the tiered licensing system is something that we really can use to our advantage. So someone who might have a four-year degree who may be interested in shifting into education, in fact, we're just scheduling someone who emailed me today saying, um, and I think we're going to see a little bit more of this as people start to settle out after the pandemic. A person who's been in business for a long time, who is looking to get in that, into education, has already signed up as a substitute, is coming in to meet with me to see how might I be able to become a teacher. He didn't mention that he was interested in being a special education teacher, but the tiered licensing system is our friend in this case. So someone with a four-year degree who is looking to shift into education may not will, be willing you know, to, to go for a position that only requires a high school diploma and thus a, a commensurate amount of hourly pay. But for someone shifting from another profession with a four-year degree into a position like this with a tier one license, which they would be eligible for, for a $50,000 salary, we may have more candidates. Now this is all may, should, would, hope, you know. but again, we can either sit back and say, well, what else are you gonna do? Or we can try to look at how can we entice people who during the pandemic, I do think there are some folks who are looking and now saying, wow, public service. I'm really hopeful people are saying public service is something that I would like to spend my life with. And this is a way that we potentially could get them into the system. Thank you. And again, I really appreciate and I'm grateful for the approach that you continue to take to, to navigate these challenges because they're, they're quite complex. So thank you. Thank you, Julie. And Cheryl, Julie was asking about if we should uh, try to approve this tonight or if we should wait another to the next meeting? Well, of course, I would, I would always say um, I want you to have the accurate information um, in order to make a good approval um, or, or um, say, you know, we need to wait. I, I would honor that, of course. Um, and uh, if we could move on it quickly, that would, that would, all, that's always wonderful if we're able to do that. And I'd like to remind the board too that this is a little different than some of the other items that we brought to you that this is still hypothetical in nature, right? So even we potentially could even post the position and when we, we could bring it, we, we will not have someone in ten, you know, by the time we meet the next time. So um, if you, what I would say is if you, if, if there are people who 
have an objection to this approach. I think it'd be good for us to hear it now, but you would get multiple times to be able to address this because even if we do bring a candidate forward the next time, you would still approve that candidate uh, at that meeting, you know, for hire, should we recommend it. So I think if people want to just, if you want to wait, you certainly can. You can certainly just, if anyone has an objection to this, I think it'd be good for us to hear it now. Then we could certainly maybe consider it as an action item. But I'm not hearing people say, oh, this is a bad idea. I think Val's got a way in. Can I here. update the map? <laughs> um, so we ran a couple scenarios where, depending on um, our average teacher, right now, if you look across, is MA 10, step seven. But it, the odds of us finding an MA 10 step seven at this point in the year are probably low. Um, so we also ran just a BA step three, just comparatively to see what the difference would be. And so the on the SPED license, the 85 is um, the average teacher and the special ed reimbursement. Um, we only get 55% reimbursed on the salary. So there is a discrepancy there between the amount of FICA and TRA and para between the two salaries. So that calculation is accurate. It's the net cost that's different. The 32,925 would actually be um, the net cost on the BA3. So it, it's the net cost on the MA107, which is the 85,000 is about 44,700. Um, so very close to breaking even, but if we bring in somebody that's um, less than our average, so at a lower step, it would be a, a more um, significant savings actually to the district, if that makes sense. So too many numbers to look at. Yeah. June. So I would like to make a motion to approve the hiring of a 1.0 FTE licensed special education resource teacher for the high school. Okay. Is there a second? Second by Corey. All right. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. So we will place that in the um, items for individual action tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Cheryl. Thanks, Cheryl. Okay. Um, all right. So now we're going to turn our attention to policies 104, 610.1, 612, and 619. This is a first reading. Are there any comments before board members? Any questions or comments? Uh, yes, I would just like to highlight uh, the four policies that you have. The first one is just the uh, updating of policy 104 to match with the adopted strategic plan. So simply uh, just some crosswalking of uh, our strategic plan that you've already approved into policy. Uh, 601, 610.1 school assembly programs. Uh, again, we're doing a little bit more definition just of the large uh, group activity, really moving some of it from a lower segment in the general statement of policy uh, a little bit further up. And then again, really just trying to say that any assembly programs that we have should align with the vision, strategic commands and benchmarks or the community values as determined by the school board. So again, not substantial change to the policy, just really wording and how it is framed. In development of uh, the next two are items that are in alignment with what we need to do for the state. So development of parent and family engagement policies for Title I programs. This is really just updating the policy to match what the latest practices are. Again, not what I would say substantive policy change, but more description of what uh, how the process actually takes place. And really essentially the same thing for 619 staff development for standards. So those are the four policies this evening. Good, thank you. Board members, do you have any questions or comments on any of the policies? Hmm. I just had a question about policy 612 development of parent and family engagement. Yes. Um, I'm just wondering, does is there uh, does it would it make sense where we say um, throughout parents we on one point indicate family members, but specifically parents or guardians? Yeah, so uh, we will take a look at that. So um, we're gonna take that comment and try to determine uh, how we could make it more inclusive is what I'm hearing you say. Parents and caregivers is really the terms that we've been going to. This is one that aligns with a required approach for engagement. And sometimes the if the word is specific in the Title I program, for example, we need to match the language. 
So uh, that is your, but there's nothing to say we couldn't at least provide some further definition, but uh, we'll take that uh, feedback and uh, make any changes that we are able. We of course want that language to be inclusive, uh, the most inclusive that it can be. Thanks for that feedback. Thank you. Yes. I was just saying to add a note to that is parent or guardian or whoever has the, the legal, um, you know, right to work with that student. Yeah, typically we're using the term parent or caregiver. Those are the ones that um, we seem to be the most inclusive. And that would go along, Jeff, with what you're saying, the legal right to that. Any other comments or questions? Um, I wondered on that on policy 612, Matt, I understand that it's um, a federal mm -hmm. tie. Um, is there something, like how does the state deal with those federal um, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah. <laughs> Just the federal stuff, right? Yes. So remember what happens with uh, all federal programs is they flow through the state. Mm -hmm. So while the feds write the rules mm -hmm. and they write the, the, the statute, if you will, the state is responsible for implementing them. So we don't usually directly deal with anyone from the U.S. Department of Education. We deal with the Minnesota Department of Education person responsible for that particular area. So it's really a flow through piece. And so, but what's interesting is the state then has to adopt rules for the state of how, uh, for that state of how they're going to implement it. Give you a great example. So uh, with, let's just use accountability. So the statewide accountability system is set by the uh, federal, um, every student Su succeeds act. So the state testing and all those kinds of things are required by the federal government. How we implement those are done at the state level and then the accountability, we write a plan that the feds then approve. Just like we write a plan at the district level that the state approves, the state has to write a plan to align with what the federal regulations are. So that is how it, the state really serves as kind of a middle management layer, if you will. Is that helpful? Yes, but um, we w you said we wouldn't work with any representation from the federal level. It would all be through the state. We typically, so yes, we would align with whatever the fe whatever the state says we have to do to align with the federal regulations. So is there any value in having a wording in 612 that says something about the state of Minnesota or it's not? Yeah, we will find out. Um, we can certainly ask that question. Um, we can ask that question. Okay, thank you. Okay, so um, we are on to... Um, the facility plan voter survey update. Yes, just wanted to briefly give you a facility, a high school facility plan voter survey update. So just to recap, we have partnered with the city of Northfield, um, who is helping us with the financial component of a voter survey. We have contract with Morris Leatherman to do a 400 uh, voter uh, stratified randomized sample survey. We have been working with a small team of people from when, within the district, including uh, Val Murdestorf, myself, Claudia, uh, Cole Nelson, and we've included Sal Bagley from uh, Wold Architects. Um, I have a couple of board members who are also going to give me some additional feedback on the survey, but we're ready to be launching it. Uh, they're ready to start calling people next week. So we're going to have a, around between 35 and 40 questions. Uh, it's really interesting to work with the company because they do this all of the time. And so they have, so for example, there are some questions that uh, there's two different versions of and that some people will receive one version of the question and others will receive other versions of the question. And the goal is to be able to give you the best information about what voters are thinking about the two pathways that we have forward and the potential athletic facilities that we're also considering. So we are on target. Uh, we anticipate that we will start to see voter calls happen. Uh, it will also be done in Spanish for a representative portion of our uh, Spanish speaking population. And so we are on target. It's gonna depend on how long it takes them to get those. They will keep calling until they get the 400 callers and the demographics match the district. So uh, we are hopeful that that will happen fairly quickly. What Morris Leatherman tells me is that people are willing to talk to them if it is about local issues. You start to talk about state or federal issues, people have less patience for them. But we are very excited to get this data. So I just wanted to share with you that we continue it, uh, the process going down the road. This uh, Ben Mardig from the city has also been involved in uh, taking a look at the survey as well. So we've got the feedback from the city. Uh, we are on track at this point. Thank you. Any questions or comments? 
All righty. Um, finally, we have Dr. Hillman, Superintendent, State of the District Address. And I'm going to move to the podium to do this one. I'm really pleased that I have about 90 minutes to complete this. No, I'm, I'm just kidding. These are the jokes people, right? We start off with that. Uh, so I'm really thrilled uh, to be able to share with you tonight uh, the 2022-23 State of the District presentation. This is a preview. Uh, we'll be sharing this presentation a couple of additional times. Of course, the tradition is that uh, we share this presentation in its uh, full nature with uh, a Chamber of Commerce luncheon. That Chamber of Commerce luncheon is scheduled for 11.30 a.m on September 21st at the Northfield Golf Club. If board members want to attend, uh, please let Anita know and we'll work on facilitating getting you registered for that. We would love to have you uh, be there and uh, to be able to interact with members of our business community, other interested people from the community about uh, our state of the district. So again, um, I am not a Green Bay Packers fan and I'm not uh, too excited today about the Vikings win yesterday. Actually, I am. Uh, but I really loved a book I read about Vince Lombardi, a fellow New Yorker, uh, who said that winners are boring. They do the same things over and over again, and they do them very well. And you have seen every school improvement plan that you have heard. The presenter has talked about the vision because when you start to tell me that you're sick about hearing about the vision, I will tell you we are about halfway there. And so it is so important to continue to reinforce our vision that we prepare every student, not some students every student for lifelong success by developing critical thinkers who are curious and ready to engage in our society. And you folks sat in this room and worked very hard to think about every word in that vision statement. And we cannot share it with the community or our students or our staff enough because what our job is as a board is to set the direction and the vision is the direction. And so what we want people to do is to see themselves in this vision. We don't want a vision that hangs on the wall. We want a vision that walks the halls. And so we cannot share this enough with you. We cannot share the strategic commitments enough. I'm so proud of what our school improvement plan presenters have shared with you over the last couple of months. You have seen how they have aligned their work with the strategic plan and with these strategic commitments. Thinking about people, we are a people business. Understand that we are responsible for learner outcomes because our job is to make sure that students are prepared, that they have the skills and the dispositions to be able to uh, go after whatever it is that they would like to do with their life to pursue their version of the American dream. Equity, making sure that there is a genuine fairness in people having an opportunity to achieve that American dream. We're going to talk about that during the report making sure that people know about what we're trying to do here, right? Quality two-way communication. We have to be good stewards of what has been entrusted to us. And often people think of money only when we think of stewardship, but it's about the facilities. It's about the energy that we use every day. It's about the time that our staff spend with students. All of that are, all of those things are precious resources and we need to be good stewards of all of them. And finally, we know that we cannot do this alone and that we need partnerships that help us accelerate toward the achievement of our district benchmarks. What makes our strategic plan different, I think, and I'm very proud of this, is that you have taken a stand. You didn't just put something flowery out there that is fun to put on you know, a nice graphical uh, representation that we can hand out a poster. You actually identified specific benchmarks that we are holding ourselves accountable to. And the first seven of those benchmarks, as you know, align directly with our work with the community, with Northfield Promise and over 20 organizations that have come together to say, we are all going to work together to do good things for kids, to help them uh, achieve their dreams. And so these benchmarks, which I'm not going to go through uh, each one, but um, I have to tell you, I wasn't on cloud seven, eight or nine. I was in cloud 13 when our activities director is talking explicitly about how his school improvement plan goals align with the district benchmarks. It doesn't get any better than that, right? People are seeing how their individual work aligns with these benchmarks and you've seen evidence of that 
in our school improvement plan presentations. So I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about my reflections on uh, how we have done around each of the strategic commitments. And so when we think about people, and in this case, I'm not going to hit every bullet if that's okay, uh, because many of these things you have heard before. Um, so I'm going to just highlight a few of the bullet points. And then uh, if you'd like more information on something that I didn't specifically highlight, it's of course in the narrative, but I'd be happy to talk about it further. So we've all heard about staffing levels. And so we do feel very fortunate uh, that we have all of our licensed staffing positions filled. We feel very fortunate. Not many districts are able to say that. We also know that we continue to struggle in hiring uh, for specific hourly positions. And these really do impact our students and our families and our community. You just heard a presentation from Cheryl Hall hearing about our struggles to uh, support and to, to hire educational assistance. But we also are really facing a real struggle hiring school-aged care staff. So these are the people who meet kids in the morning, right, when they're dropped off anytime, sometimes after 6 a.m., and are picked up at the end of the day by their parents, sometimes close to 6 p.m. And I've had messages from people in the community who have shared with me, they understand the difficulty that we're facing, but also sharing the real challenges that that cap, we've had to put a cap on the number of students that we can serve because we just cannot get enough staff for those uh, positions before and after school. So those are the areas we're also really in the past for things like partnerships with HCI for things like Promise Fellows. So these are AmeriCorps volunteers who get a modest stipend who do a lot of work with our students. We Normally, we never have a problem filling those positions. We have several of those open, and they're really impacting uh, specifically, for example, the Student Success Center at the high school is missing a couple of Promise Fellows who would be very helpful with those students. So when you talk about staffing levels, there's uh, two stories. We're so thrilled to have the quality licensed staff that we've been hired because we know that that's not the same in other districts. And then we have a couple of position areas where we still are really struggling, but we don't give up, right? You've seen our yard signs. You've seen the pushes that we've done on social media this week. In fact, we just finalized a flyer today that's going to go home in every elementary student's backpack with, uh, for example, one of our educational assistants has offered to say, I would love to serve as a reference for how good this job is, especially if you, if you have young kids how it matches with the school schedule. So we even have our own people who are willing to testify that this is a great place to work and that the work is meaningful, but it is really a, a dichotomy that we're facing. Uh, we also know that engagement and satisfaction of our staff and our parents is really essential. And so we have reactivated our employee engagement and our parent satisfaction surveys. You had copies of those surveys in your packets this evening. Uh, you also have heard about those results through all of the school improvement plans, right? Because our school improvement plans are having at least one goal focused on employee engagement and something else related to parent satisfaction, specifically around communication. We'll talk about that a little bit later. When it comes to people, we're also so proud of Cheryl Hall, the Minnesota Administrator of Special Educators, um, Minnesota Administrators of Special Education, the Director of the Year. My only question is how she had not won it before, right? Uh, an amazing servant leader, so we're so proud of her. You've heard about the core performance expectations. If we think about any job, what do people want? People want fulfillment. They want to know that what they're doing makes a difference. But it also comes down to clarity of what are the expectations? What do you want me to fulfill? And organizations that are not successful, they are clear as mud. So I'm happy to, that you this evening at your desks um, have a copy of the core performance expectations. These core performance expectations, it starts with a strategic plan on the front, and then on the interior, it has the first five, and in the back, it has the final two. And these core performance expectations are things that are expected of every staff member in the district, um, regardless of a person's per, uh, position, because they are things that cut across all areas. And if we really want excellence in student outcomes, we need the adults to be working together and to have a common set of expectations for how we work. If you've ever worked in an environment that does not have it, you know you don't get much done. If you've worked in an environment where it is super clear about what we're doing, what our goals are, what the expectations that we have are, the uh, ceiling for success in those organizations is limitless. And this is intended to take us to that limitless ceiling approach. And we do, we are unapologetic. We worked with 13 different, not just teachers, but all staff through the district 
This was, we started those core performance expectations with our administrators. Over a year, we worked on them. Then 13 staff members came together to help us polish them and to set examples for what does a high performer look like? What is high performance behavior? And if you're gonna talk about high performance behavior, we know that around 5% or less in any organization you have are, of employees are low performers. It's not a ton of people, but boy, they can really make a difference. So we also call out the inverse. What does low performance look like? And very few people are always a high performer or always a low performer, right? They're usually, they trend one way or the other, but these are intended, first of all, for self-reflection. And then in the future, they will be used for how we potentially give a value to feedback uh, to people in this system. So this was a big piece of our, of our commitment to people to make sure that clarity was prioritized above all other things. You've already talked about the work teams. I won't uh, go into that. We also have to recognize that we have all dealt with loss. So when we talk about this, this we used to call this presentation celebrations and challenges. or celebrate. And, and this year, we're kind of mixing them together. And we know that we've all dealt with loss. Many people in this school district have dealt with loss in one way, shape, or form um, through losing events that were really meaningful to them, or even the loss of life. You know, family members or friends who we've lost to COVID, we all mourn the loss of Melanie Valencia, who died far too young before the school year. We also mourn the loss of Josiah Shermer, who died tragically just days after he had graduated. And so we have to recognize that loss is real and to grieve that is important because we do have a bright future, but we also have to recognize the challenges and the loss that we've all had. And when you're committed to people, we have to do both the good things and the things that are hard and loss is hard. Part of that is also about resetting expectations. Our theme for the year is reset because we have to come back to what is the core of what we expect for everything. And that's what these core performance expectations are for. You heard uh, Mr. Byer and uh, Ms. Bang and uh, Mr. Bourne talk about that at the high school. With, do you know how much it takes to be able to go to every single core class at a high school? That's pretty significant, but they're doing it because the reset matters. And so making sure that everyone is on the same page about what we can all expect of each other is important. And then we all just have to acknowledge as, as positive I, as I am about what public service has meant for my career. I have dedicated my life to public service and I will continue to dedicate my life to public service for the remainder of how long I'm allowed to be here and on this earth. And the key thing is we do have to recognize that there's also been a toll. Being in public service over the last two and a half years has not been easy. And some people understandably so are saying, why should I continue this? But we can't accept that. We have to double down and we have to say how important we cannot have a functioning democracy without qualified, without passionate, and without forward-thinking public servants. So that is a challenge that we face as we move forward. When we think about learner outcomes, none of us would say that we are pleased with the proficiency levels that we demonstrated on the most recent rounds of MCAs. Now, MCAs are one assessment, right? They're one piece of the puzzle, but they are important. And the reason that they're important is that they do, if you think about a person who meets expectations on those assessments, there are outliers for sure. There are students who don't meet expectations who can do far more than what that assessment might entail. But I always think about what does that meets expectation describe? It means that I can do certain academic things that open the doors for me. And so we are not satisfied with where our proficiency rates were, but we are proud of where we rank in the state. So when we sort all of the school districts in the state, Northfield outperformed 90% of other school districts holistically when it comes to mathematics and 85% of the district state's districts in reading. We finished in the top third in science and we performed better than all big nine districts. Um, but again, we have proficiency rates uh, that we need to improve. Uh, I think an AP test results are something important for the community here. So you can see on the screen that 81% of the tests taken last year, there are 520 AP exams and 81% of those earned college credit, whether the college accepts them or not, or how it would, depending on what the students, uh, but they did qualify for college credit for uh, schools that take those. We are not just sitting back, even though we're in the top 15% in the state in reading, we have a long way to go because we want every student to read well by the end of third grade, right? That's one of our benchmarks. And so we have around 50 staff registered for the letters training, and we have already paid $25,000 in stipends because this is not, not send you to the training. 
This is send you to the training. We're going to resource it. And we're going to make sure that you actually complete it, right? And are able to use it because it's about making sure that we trust that you're taking, but we also want to validate that you're finishing and utilizing those strategies. And so uh, that letters training is game changers. From learner outcomes, you see a beautiful photo uh, on the screen of Rock and Roll Revival. You see a wonderful photo of our Robo Raiders competing uh, at uh, um, the state tournament uh, in terms of the, the first robotics tournament. Many of the regular things were regular, right? And that's a good thing. We're not pretending that they were normal, right? But many of the regularly scheduled events happened as they were scheduled. They might have looked a little bit different. They may have felt a little bit different, but most events were regular. And then we've talked a number of times about resetting expectations and attendance is where we're starting, right? Showing up is important. And we know that that's a metric that can help us cut across all sorts of challenges that we have coming out of the pandemic. When it comes to equity, uh, we are focused on making sure that every student has a genuinely fair chance to achieve their version of the American dream. And so when we think about that, I, I really wanna point to some, what I think is some positive trending data coming out of our student surveys. So I'm gonna read this to you just because I wanna make sure that I get it right. So we asked questions uh, through a series of pulse surveys in 21 and 22. And what I wanna share with you is that we did make some real gains where students of color and white students responded to these questions in a very similar way. And so a gap, to me, a gap between that would really spell that we have some concerns, but they answered this question very similarly. So teachers at my school care about students. Nearly the same number of students of color responded favorably to that question as our white students with a range between 88 and 90% of both students of color and white students either agreeing or strongly agreeing with that statement. That goes through the, both the middle school and the high school. And when we look at the other Paul survey question, most teachers at my school care about me and are interested in me as a person. Similarly, 83 to 86% of students in those groups agreed or strongly agreed with that statement. So we're not seeing a variance there. There's obviously room for improvement, no question. We want every student to feel that. Now we are dealing with teenagers, right? And sometimes they don't always think that the adults care about them and that's okay, right? We keep working at that. But I do think that that does show that we have made progress. Is it exactly where we want to be right now? No, but there is not a substantial gap in that, um, in that metric. Uh, we continue to work on the Grow Your Own grant. I've shared that you be with you before. We uh, continue to embed equity work within our PLC work. As Hope Langston said, equity work is PLC work and PLC work is equity work. We've added a fifth question to the equity or the PLC questions to make sure that we're thinking through are the uh, things that we're doing having the same impact on all students? You have a copy of something that I've handed every staff. Was at your table tonight, the equity magnifier. These are a series of questions that the Minnesota Department of Education has given to decision makers to be able to take a look and say, when we're making decisions like you, or when we're thinking about our PLC work, when we ask these questions, have we involved people? Have we made sure that we're trying to avoid avoidable consequences if we're not thinking about everyone because everyone means everyone. And so we're very proud of, of this work. We have a long uh, route to go, but we have a plan. And we think that that plan is very workable and it is about student outcomes. Uh, we are uh, continuing to work with the Northfield Racial, Ethnic, and Equity, uh, uh, Racial and Ethnic Equity Coalition. I showed you those posters at the beginning of this evening. We still ch are challenged by this misrepresentation of what equity work means. We have seen this term co-opted uh, across the country in political campaigns and a variety of different ways across the country. And I just wanna come back and say it for the fourth time tonight, which is when we talk about equity, we are simply saying that everyone, not just some people, right? But everyone truly and genuinely has a fair chance to be able to achieve whatever their hopes and dreams are. Some people like to categorize that as the American dream. That's what I like to, to look at it as. But we have to understand at the end of the day, let's cut through the noise and the commercials and all those things. There's a lot of misdirection with this term. When we get down to brass tacks, it's about basic human decency and making sure people have a fair chance to be what they want to be in life. And we continue to work on our achievement gaps as, we, as we've discussed. And we continue to work on making sure that we hold ourselves accountable for our own individual behaviors, and you see that through our anti-racism framework. When we come to the strategic commitment around communication, uh, this is an area that we have both made great strides and still have a lot of work to do. 
And so, as you know, in our employee engagement survey, we had tremendous feedback from our staff around the cascading communication approach that we use with 88% of our respondents agreeing with the statement that the superintendent uses a variety of methods to promote effective communication throughout the district. So we really feel like we've made some real headway with making sure that our staff understand where the district is at. In fact, another data point that I did not put in here is uh, something I'm very proud of is that we had a very high percentage, over 80% of people uh, agreed or strongly agreed with the statement that they understood the district's uh, vision and goals or mission. And goals. I'm, I'm not quoting the, the uh, question perfectly, but people did know what the, they had a good understanding of what the mission and the goals of the district are. I think that that's great as well. We have a lot of room to grow when it comes to parent communication, because for as many parents as we have, there's a different way to communicate with them. So you've heard through all the school improvement plans about how we're working specifically to provide feedback about a person's child. And so uh, we had an average rating on a five-point scale of 3.52 for the statement, I regularly receive feedback from school staff on how well my child is learning. You've heard that family engagement is a focal point this year and thinking about how every we can give positive and uh, specific feedback to every student a couple of, at least a couple of times a year because most kids should get that often, right? And every child can get that positive feedback about things that they're doing well. That's what starts that uh, flywheel of success is when we can recognize the strengths that we have. And so when we think about that strategic commitment of communication, uh, the employee engagement and the parent satisfaction surveys are important. We've already talked about the work team approach. Uh, I'm, we're really uh, pleased with uh, the KYMN segments. We're so proud of that work with them where we are able to share. Uh, basically, we they are helping us podcast the radio show that I do. And then you've also heard many other directors and folks from the school, Catherine Nori talking about our Salicart. We really have a great partnership to be able to utilize their system to get our message out to the community. When it comes to stewardship, we all know that we have worked very hard on budget prioritization. We continue to have a struggle with declining enrollment. We are awaiting our first report of the year about enrollment. That is the first Friday report. We don't have it quite yet but we're very interested to see where last Friday's data landed. We also think about stewardship from things like uh, taking care of the facilities that have already been entrusted to us. So we did a, a, the entire middle school roof replaced this summer. That was uh, that was that roof was original to the building when it opened in uh, the early 2000s. The high school office remodel, uh, you have all, most of you, if not all of you have had a chance to see that. We think that that's a great stewardship story of how we have re- uh, fit, reconfigured and rethought that office space. It's not substantially different from how it was before, but the nurse's office is really significantly different from how it was before. So that's a good use of how we took a space and reimagined it. Things like the Bridgewater Science Room, uh, a new classroom that was created by our own maintenance folks out of two smaller classrooms to be able to account for larger classes at Bridgewater, regular painting. I will not go down the road I can't even talk about the uh, special education cross subsidy without uh, having some kind of Pavlovian response, but you have all heard my uh, lamentations about the special education cross subsidy. I continue to ask the state legislature to come back and do their work. As you've seen, we keep asking them, come back and do your work, come back and do your work. You've got $9 billion that you could have helped us with. Um, clearly the window for that is closing but I won't stop. We'll keep going on that until at least election day. We know the challenge that we've had state funding that has not kept up with inflation over the years. We know that we're right now working on a capital projects levy renewal and expansion that will be very important to the district. And finally, we'll have some facility decisions to make about the high school when it comes to stewardship as well. Finally, in the area of partnerships, our legislative action committee, 17 people showed up nearly every, at least every other Saturday for quite some time. In fact, I See one of our members here in the audience. Thanks for being here, Telford, and an active member of our Legislative Action Committee. But to get 17 people to keep showing up to anything, I think these days is a challenge. And yet we really did make an impact. And that's a partnership that we had with our community to carry the message of the school district forward to the legislature. And a proud moment was when we were in a uh, Zoom call with one of the chairs of one of the education committees. They said, oh, yes, we know how Northfield feels because we have heard from them many times. And that was really a direct result of our work on the Legislative Action Committee. Um, the community school expansion that you've heard about is an outstanding example of partnerships. We are so thrilled to have our volunteers back without uh, mitigation strategies needed. 
Uh, that's outstanding to have volunteers. We had volunteers back, but we you have even more back this year because I think people are just more comfortable being in the school setting this year. Uh, as you know, we have an outstanding partnership with Northfield Healthy Community Initiative, and we'll continue to leverage that. Uh, our partnership with KYMN and NorthfieldLive.com is one I want you to keep an eye on. So NorthfieldLive.com is a partner with KYMN to where they are broadcasting a number of student events for us, whether that be athletics, concerts, other kinds of things. And so we're posting on our social media each week what they are broadcasting. And there are around 20 students who are also involved in that project where they're doing the production, they're doing the play-by-play, -play, they're doing the video. And if you don't think that ma this makes a difference, last Saturday afternoon, uh, if you tuned in like I did to KRUI, which is the University of Iowa uh, radio station, student radio station, class of 2022 graduate Adam Reister, AJ Reister, was the co color commentary person for the University of Iowa Hawkeye football game against Iowa State. If you know anything about this, this is a pretty big deal. So a kid for, who just graduated, who got the experience by being part of this Northfield Live uh, collaboration was calling the Cy Hawk trophy game. And that's a pretty big deal. And so that's the kind of thing, that's, that's real career technical education, right? Getting kids those opportunities. And a freshman right from Northfield High School is calling. Now, I had to tell him, you know, I'm a Gopher fan. You're still not going to get me to root for the Hawkeyes. But he's excited to come up and call that Gopher Hawkeye game the uh, the the uh, Floyd of Rosedale game here in a few weeks. So we're just so happy with that partnership. And then we also now coming out of the pandemic have a lot of folks who want to do good things for kids, right? Not all in our community, a lot of nationwide or statewide groups really want to do some good things for kids. And we have to be thoughtful about what partnerships we select. We can't do partnerships with everyone, right? So our goal is how do we do partnerships that help us accelerate our advancement toward uh, the outcomes that you have suggested the benchmarks. So we have to be choosy about what partnerships we pick, and that's not always easy. So as we've shared with you before, this is a reset year. Uh, we are pressing the proverbial reset button on the back of that uh, Nintendo original device that we have pictured on the screen here. And we're just resetting what our expectations are for each other. Uh, we have had challenges uh, that no one could have ever, ever seen coming over the last two years, but it does feel like a substantial weight has been lifted and that we are moving forward in a very positive way. So with that, I want to thank the board for their attention to this presentation. I would certainly take any of your feedback that you might have about how I could strengthen the presentation for further uh, sharing with the Chamber of Commerce and then Rotary after that. Uh, but I'd be happy to stand for any questions at this time. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Any questions or comments? Okay, excellent job. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to say, I, from the board perspective, I like how you organized your comments uh, around our strategic commitments. So I thought that was interesting and like to see how that plays out. I also want to say thank you for your leadership over the last two years. And it's been so nice to know that we've come successfully through the pandemic and now we're moving forward and continuously improving from here. It's been my pleasure. Okay. Well done on the abridged version of your presentation. I offer one correction for you as someone who grew up playing the Nintendo Entertainment System, the reset buttons on the front, not the back. And, and the picture showed that. So that is my apologies. Foolish in front. I actually have one of those in my house. And so I should have uh, noticed that. I appreciate and will make that correction in my comments. <laughs> Very good. Thank you. If that's the worst comment we get, we're in good shape, right? Thank you so much. Okay, we're at item six, the consent agenda. Um, note that we don't have the correct minutes in there. We have August 8th minutes instead of August 22nd. And so we're just going to bring those to you next time. Um, are there any, oh, so we're gonna pull that out, the minutes, and then the rest of it. Is there anything anybody else would like to pull from the consent grouping for separate consideration? Okay, is there a motion to approve the consent grouping? Okay, moved by Jeff, second by Dewey. All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? 
motion carries. All right, item seven, we have a motion um, or we have a request to hire a special ed teacher using the funding of um, three EA or educational assistants. So is there a motion to approve this new hire? Okay, moved by Amy, second by Noel. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, motion passes. All right, that's the only item for action that we have tonight. I have some items for inf of information. We have the website up for the Capital Projects Levy Referendum. That's on the homepage of the Northfield Public Schools website. Um, so northfieldpublicschools.org slash CPL for Capital Projects Levy. There are also two public meetings set for September 22nd and October 6th from 6 to 7.15 in the district office gymnasium. Um, and then you would enter off door five in the parking lot. Yeah. I was looking at the table file and there's a resolution in there. Is that something that requires a vote tonight or is that for the resolution accepting donations from the, for the elementary schools? So uh, my understanding is that since it's in the consent agenda that that the resolution is included in the table in the consent agenda. So it's not something separate. Even though it's a resolution, it doesn't need that is a correct. Choice. Not not every resolution, not all resolutions actually have to be done the way that we typically do them. So it's acceptable. This is how we typically do the gift agreements. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Thanks good, for good question though. No, no. Okay. Um, our future meetings are Monday, September 26th, October 10, and October 24th, 6 p.m. in the district boardroom. That's all the business that we have for tonight. Is there a motion to adjourn? Move by Noel, second. Second by Corey. <laughs> Sorry, that you were raising your. Okay, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Okay. Opposed? Okay, motion carries. We are adjourned. Thanks, everyone.